Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, he never saw it coming. Welcome back, Genies, to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher, your radio root sleuth, on America's first and only national radio show on family history, now heard on a growing list of radio stations. And what a week it has been. I am not going to out anybody here because I appreciate anybody who likes to fill us in on new discoveries and family history news stories. You are all friends of the show. But this past week was, of course... April Fool's Day, and that meant stuff was out there, and a few people bit, and then sent it on to me to share with you. Now, they didn't know these stories weren't true, so I just feel like, hey, unless I've never been fooled by a prank on April Fool's or any other day, who am I to call them out on it? This was the best of them, though. (laughs) It came from a listener who spotted it on findmypast.com. It reads, Landmark Breakthrough. Death records for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde discovered on Find My Past, a horror mystery breakthrough. Find My Past is thrilled to announce an incredible breakthrough in one of the most famous popular mysteries of the last century. Our stellar London team has recovered the death records of both Dr. Henry Jekyll and his sometime associate, Mr. Edward Hyde. This data, in concurrence with some recently unearthed articles from our newspaper archives, marks the most significant breakthrough in this case since the Victorian era. So, nice job to the Find My Past folks. I'm sure you got more than a few people with that one. And nice graphics, too. I am very excited about our guest this week. She was a keynote speaker at RootsTech and, as a lawyer, makes her case for all kinds of things very succinctly. Her name is Judy Russell, and she's known as the legal genealogist. And we will put her to the test starting in about eight minutes on a couple of different topics. First is her proposition that our family stories are lost typically forever, if not preserved, in just three generations. Yipes. I mean, there is a call to action. We'll get into that and what to do about it. Plus, when it comes to the law, what do we need to know as it applies to family history? I think what Judy has to say on that will be a wake-up call to many of us amateur researchers. I think I'd be putty in her hands if I was in a jury box and she was arguing a case. I guarantee many of the things she says will stick with you. You know, recently I read a book by Brian Kilmeade and Don Yeager called George Washington's Secret Six. I was on a short vacation and plowed through it twice in just a few days. It is about America's first spy ring based in New York during the Revolution. It is no less gripping a story than if it happened in the 21st century. What's more amazing is the lengthy research covering over a century of various researchers who put together the identities of all the spies except one female who remains nameless and likely will forevermore. So you can imagine how excited I was to turn on the tube the other night and learn that AMC has begun a new series called Turn about this, the so-called Culper Spy Ring. If you want to know what life was like for your ancestors, especially during British occupation, you're going to want to watch this series. Turn is on ABC on Sunday nights. And by the way, after reading the book, I took a quick peek at the lineage of the five known spies and found that one of them, Caleb Brewster, is descended from some of my ancestors in Connecticut, making him a distant cousin of some sort. He's the one who rowed the whale boat across Long Island Sound to Connecticut to deliver the ring's secret messages. Interesting how knowing little things like that increase your involvement in the story. I cannot wait to see this. From the pages of ExtremeGenes.com, here is your family histoire news for this week. We start with a fascinating name list from NameBerry.com. They call them good names with bad, bad meanings. 
If uh, if someone you love is looking to name a baby anytime soon, this is fair warning. Here are a few from that list. It's a Scottish name, Cameron, meaning crooked nose. This one's a Latin name. It's Portia, meaning pig. From Germany came the name Lorelei, which means lurking rock. Kennedy is a Gaelic name, meaning misshapen head. This one's kind of common. Calvin, it's Latin. It means bald. Mallory is a French name, meaning unfortunate. Avery came from the Anglo-Saxons, meaning ruler of the elves. Olivia is an English name. Elf army is the meaning of that. And Mara comes from the Hebrew word meaning bitter. You can see a longer list at ExtremeGenes.com. And if your name was just mentioned, I apologize. Next, ever think of looking to the life of your ancestors to solve your 21st century problems? One British woman did. Her name is Carolyn Eakins. She looked back to life during World War II to find a solution to her obesity and financial problems. At her peak, she weighed 350 pounds. Well, not only did her weight negatively impact her quality of life, it was also costing her far more money to sustain her eating habits than she could afford. What did she do? Well, as a World War II enthusiast, Carolyn started reading old pamphlets and ration recipes from the early 1940s that had been issued by the Ministry of Food during the war. As an experiment, she began to follow their instructions. And as a result, she got off today's junk food, noting that her tastes actually adjusted to the change in just two weeks. Over many months, Carolyn lost 80 pounds. On top of that, her food bill went from $120 a week to only $25 a week, a savings of over 80%. That's a savings rate of $5,000 a year after taxes. Now she's lighter, happier, and richer. Get more of the details at ExtremeGenes.com. If you find a story or have one of your own, we would love to hear it. That's why we've set up our Extreme Genes fine line toll-free at 1-234-56-GENES. That's 1-234-56-GENES, G-E-N-E-S. You can leave comments, suggestions, questions, as well as your stories from the trail. And be sure to let us know how we can get back to you, and maybe we'll even have you on the show. And coming up next, she's a genealogical expert that says your family stories will vanish in just three generations unless you do something about it now. She's the legal genealogist, Judy Russell, and she'll also tell you why you need to know the law when it comes to family history. You'll be sharing this conversation with your friends. It's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Your priceless 8mm home movies and your precious family videos are deteriorating right now. Heat, moisture, insects, dust, mold, time, they're all robbing you of your family's memories. It's time to preserve those treasures right now by digitizing them at tmcplace.com. They've been preserving memories for over 40 years. Home movies, videos, audio tapes, vinyl records, photos, slides, and even scrapbooks. Whether your treasures are enduring the humidity of Massachusetts or the heat of Arizona, tmcplace.com can digitize your audio and images without harming the originals and returning them to you with free shipping both ways on most orders. tmcplace.com can even let you track your package in real time with a special GPS tracking device. Trustworthy, experienced, affordable. Call tmcplace.com toll-free at 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. You know, when it comes to family history, there's nothing quite like the thrill of the hunt and the excitement generated by every new discovery. Who were your immigrant ancestors? What ship did they come over on? Why did they come when they did? Did they participate in any military campaigns that took place in their day? What personal challenges did your forefathers and mothers endure? Heritage Consulting, Genealogy Research Services can get you the answers to many of these questions and more. They've been providing professional research and consultation services since 1970. Call toll-free 1-877-537-2000 to speak directly to a professional family history researcher. Heritage Consulting can research, collect, analyze, and interpret the countless documents your ancestors generated throughout their lives and present the findings to you in an attractive book or in an electronic format. The cost? Far less than you'd expect for far more than you can imagine. 877-537-2000 or go to heritageconsulting.com.
Hey, and welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, and I am so excited to have Judy Russell. She's the legal genealogist from New Jersey. How are you doing, Judy? I'm fine, Scott. How about yourself? You know, awesome. And of course, anytime we get to talk family history, I love it. You were a keynote speaker at Roots Tech, and you really stuck something in my head that I haven't been able to shake ever since that event. And that was talking about how we lose our family history in just three generations. You want to explain that? Well, you know, back in December of 2013, Judy Ramos had written an article in The Examiner. She quoted an archivist from the National Archives in Fort Worth. Aaron Holt said that it isn't unusual for us to have not only conflicting family stories, but just missing family stories in just three generations, that the stories have to be passed down deliberately and accurately if we're going to have them today. So you're... Just as it rang the chord with you, it really rang a chord with me because I've found so many situations in my own family history where either stories have been lost completely or they've just been mishandled over the generations. You remember the old childhood game of telephone in kindergarten and somebody says grasshopper at one end and it comes out helicopter at the other end. <laughs> and, yep. and we see that a lot in family history. Well, you're absolutely right. And I've been thinking about that, too, because uh, sometimes it has to do with the fact somebody dies young and they're absolutely. gone and nobody remembers who they were. And for yeah. instance, my father never knew either of his grandparents on his father's side. I have exactly the same situation. Both of my father's parents were dead before I was born. And we're talking a later time period so that I can get records like Social Security records and their immigration records since they were German-born. There's a lot of information about them I'm never going to have because my father was very closed-mouthed about his family. There wasn't that deliberate effort to pass down information. So you're saying, in essence, uh, we have to either do it by recording or by writing or some other means. And some other means can be the oral tradition of the family, as long as it's done deliberately and accurately. Okay, so wait a minute. You're going to have to help me understand, because we have on the one end the, the telephone problem <laughs> from right, grasshopper to helicopter, but doesn't the oral tradition kind of cause that same problem, or is there a way to do it where it retains the accuracy? Well, speaking about modern times, those of us here in the 21st century, we have such a capacity to record audio, visual, writing, digital, that there's no excuse for reliance solely on oral history today. But for those of us who grew up in families with an oral tradition, some of those family stories were passed down with accuracy because it, there was a very deliberate effort made. So we're talking two different time periods. If there was a deliberate and accurate method of transmitting it, grandparent to parent, parent to child, then today we may have those stories. The problem is so many of our families didn't do that. And by the time they got around to writing it down, it was helicopter and not grasshopper. One of the most, frankly, amusing aspects of this for me is the story that I first encountered when I first started doing genealogy and I discovered that what my fourth great-grandfather was a man by the name of David Baker who'd served with the 3rd Virginia Regiment in the Revolutionary War. So, you know, very exciting family history. The 3rd Virginia served with George Washington. The family story <laughs> begins with Alexander Baker coming to Boston in 1635 on the ship, the Elizabeth and Anne. He's got his wife and his two little daughters, has a whole bunch more kids in Boston, one of them being this Samuel Baker, and Samuel Baker marries a Mayflower descendant, and then they have this guy, William, who goes to Virginia, and he serves in the colonial legislature with people like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, and William's son is my fifth great-grandfather, Thomas Baker, and Thomas is right there on the main road in Virginia. <laughs> I see where every, this is going. <laughs> you know, every time George Washington comes down the road, he stays at the Baker home. It's a wonderful family history finally written down by a cousin of mine in Texas in a book that he published in the 1970s. The problem is, none of it's true. <laughs> Not one bit 
of that story until you get to Thomas, who at least existed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we did DNA testing, and we don't descend from Alexander Baker, which is okay because the Samuel Baker with the Mayflower descendant, that's not Alexander's son to begin with. And that Samuel didn't have a son named William. Oh, boy. There never was a William in the colonial legislature in Virginia. So it's a lovely story, but it's fiction. Right, and there's so many of those stories like that. We had one in our line about uh, somebody being fathered by a nobleman, and it turned out to be a, a soldier with his servant. You know, for an egalitarian community like the United States, founded on the notion of overthrowing the royalty, the desire to find the royal ancestors is, <laughs> is really kind of funny. You know, these stories get passed down, and either they're lost completely because they weren't deliberately passed down, or they're passed down in a totally inaccurate fashion. Right. And that's really what Aaron Holt was saying, that unless it is both deliberate and accurate, we end up today missing whole chunks of our family history. And, and I recall in your presentation, you talked about that, how it's so essential that we document where our information comes from as we, we try to show the accuracy of these stories. It is critical, and it's critical for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons that people always point to is, well, you want somebody else to be able to track what you did. And that's true. But more importantly, when you're documenting that, you're doing an analysis on how good is the information. That's right. Here's a perfect example. My father's death certificate is full of mistakes. Now, that's a documented, certified, state vital record from the late 20th century. Yes. But the information was provided by his third wife. She didn't know who his parents were. Mm -hmm. She didn't know how to spell the city where he was born in Germany. She didn't know so much of the information. And that's what's on record. Right, right. My but mother's when, birth record is the same way. Spelled wrong, the wrong middle name. They changed the name, uh, yep. spelled it uh, wrong in the middle name as well. Yeah. So when we look at these records, we're not just saying, okay, this is the Texas state birth record or the Virginia state death record. We're saying, who provided the information? And did that person know what the truth was or not? So that's what we're really doing when we're documenting this information. We're talking to Judy Russell. She's the legal genealogist. And Judy, this is fascinating stuff. Part of this whole thing, though, of gathering these records, obviously, is to basically create a collection from which then we analyze what we think is the truth or the best record we can create from all of them. Yes? Exactly. That the process in the genealogical proof standard, which is the process that we're all trying to get to, starts with the reasonably exhaustive search. We've got to look everywhere that the records of our families reasonably could be. We go on to citation because, there again, we're documenting where we got it, and that's the first step in analysis and correlation. What does this document tell me that I believe and why do I believe it? And how do I integrate that with everything else that I've found? That leads to the inevitable step, certainly in my family, of resolving the conflict. <laughs> yeah. When one record says A and the other record says not A, I have to do the analysis to decide what's right. And then the last step, and boy does this answer Aaron Holt's issue, is to write it down in a solidly reasoned conclusion. And that way it's not going to be lost for the future. You know, what you've just said here, I think, helps a lot of people who are probably listening to this and going, oh, you know, it, it's hard enough for me just to do the research and fill out the charts on, uh, on my program. And, and now you want me to go and do all this, but I think you're making the case why this is so important. But it's more than just that it's important for, for our family, for the pedigree sheet. The real situation here is that we, we're losing the story. Right. Everything beyond the names and birth dates and begats, what, what <laughs> I want. One of the stories that I told at Roots Tech, I want the story of not my fourth great-grandfather, but his brother who died at the Battle of Trenton in 1776 with George Washington's troops. And if I don't do all of those steps, 
I'm never going to find the one piece of paper that exists on the face of this earth that talks about Richard Baker and his loss in that battle. And I assume he has no descendants. He probably died young, unmarried. He died young, he died unmarried, and even his name wasn't passed down. One brother named a son Richard, and there were no next generation Richard. So even the name was gone after three generations. And so in essence, he belongs to you because he has no one else. Obviously, you want to know those things because he made a great sacrifice. We all do. Everybody descended from that family wants to know about Richard Baker. It's part of who we are. It's part of the sacrifice that David, my fourth great-grandfather, and there are a lot of us descended from David, it's part of what made him who he was. And that's what he passed down to his children and their children and their children. Right. It's that we're all interconnected. It's the story of everybody together and what they went through. When a baby dies, how does that affect everybody? You betcha. And that's where we need those documents. We need to go through those steps. Because I may have found out somehow that there was a Richard Baker, but how do I know what his story was and how he's connected to me? All right. We lose the stories in three generations, says Judy Russell. She's the legal genealogist. Judy, can you hang on? We'll do another segment here. We're going to talk about why it's important to know the law when it comes to doing genealogy. Sounds great. All right. It's coming up next on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. brick wall in your family tree? Don't know how to break through it? Get professional help from Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. Speak directly with an experienced genealogical researcher, not a salesperson. By calling toll-free 1-877-537-2000. When you call, ask how you could win a free one-hour consultation with an expert genealogist. Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. With over 35 years of research experience, visit heritageconsulting.com. Did you know your family's memories are being destroyed a little at a time every day? It's true. Old home movies, slides, photos, and audio recordings fade over time. The longer you delay the digitizing of these priceless artifacts, the more likely it is they'll be gone one day. That's why you need to call the Multimedia Center. I brought in VHS videotape and had them transferred to DVD. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Dot com. Hey, welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Judy Russell, the legal genealogist. And we just had a, a fascinating conversation about how we're losing our stories uh, over just three generations. And now, Judy, I want to get on to this whole thing about legalities in genealogy, because there's certainly many complications out there concerning copyright laws and photographs and who owns an image and who owns the original and what we do and what do we need to worry about. And you being a legal eagle, maybe you can fill us in on some of that. You know, the, part of the issue that we have is that we're always relying on something that was created by somebody else. That's right. Whether it's a book or a record or a document or a photograph or a website, every bit of that was created by somebody else. And what that means is that somebody somewhere may own the copyright to that document or that record or that photograph. And if we use it without getting permission, we can be in very serious trouble. So there's a, there's a whole process that we need to stop and think about every time we think about, oh, well, maybe I'll just share that or borrow that. We don't want to end up getting sued. And that's the, that's the big concern in copyright. The statutory damages for a single copyright violation run into tens of thousands of dollars. So somebody owns, say, a book, right. and, and, and maybe it's out of print, and the person who wrote it is no longer living. How do you determine who do you talk to about those things? Even maybe the publisher's out of business. What do you do with things like that? And does that matter? It does. And, and part of what we need to do is understand the 
different elements of copyright protection that come in at different time frames. And this is a very complicated structure. We're not going to go into all the details. There is a wonderful website. It is from Cornell University. It is a copyright duration chart. The author is Peter Hertel. And if you're going to do an online search, his last name is spelled H-I-R-T-L-E. And you search for that document in Bing or Google or whatever your, your search engine is. You're going to come up with a chart that's going to take you through every possibility for every document, photograph, anything you come across. That's exciting stuff. So it, 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 it just it, depends on the medium, and they all have different durations, I assume. It's not so much the medium. What it is is the time frame. Okay. Anything published in the United States before 1923... So all of those digitized Google books from the 1800s and the early 1900s are totally out of copyright. That means they're in the public domain. If they're in the public domain, you can use any portion of them any way you want. No restrictions whatsoever. So what about these that go back to 1923-24? The publisher's gone, the, the writer is deceased, it's still technically in copyright. Obviously, they're not making any money off this, so there's not a financial situation involved in that. How do we deal with that to make sure we do it right? That's a real problem. It's called orphan works. The recognized legal issue that is perplexing the U.S. Copyright Office wrote a multi-page proposal to Congress back, I think it was 2005, saying we need some way of making these orphan works available to researchers and others to use, and Congress has done absolutely nothing with it. <laughs> now, there does seem to be some movement here in 2014 towards another look at this problem of orphan works. But yeah, it's, first of all, we as genealogists probably have the least complaint because we're supposed to be able to find the descendants of the people who wrote these things. Right, right. That, that's what we're supposed to be good at. So are those descendants then those who would retain the copyright on behalf of their ancestor? It's possible. And, and again, I know that my standard response to a lot of legal questions is, it depends. But let's say, for example, that I wrote a book, and I leave a will, and in the will I say, I leave the copyright to my book to Rutgers University, my alma mater. In that case, my descendants don't own the copyright. Rutgers does. Okay. To be precise, Rutgers Law School is, is the school I graduated from. Okay. But now let's say I don't mention the copyright in my will or I don't have a will. Then it, it's going to pass in a different way. But yes, ultimately it's going to be an heir, somebody in my family who has the rights to, to the property that I didn't mention in the will. So those are the people we're, we're going to need to get the will to see if there is a declaration, <laughs> if there isn't. And, you know, these are all things that we do as genealogists anyway. Well, that is absolutely true. But to some extent, let, let's ask this question then. Are we talking about, when you say you can use this old out-of-copyright stuff any way you want, you, you still don't want to be claiming it as your own. You want to be quoting it. You want, you, know, you want to give credit where credit's due. I think there's a word for it. It's called plagiarism. It certainly is. And, Without attribution, it absolutely is plagiarism. Yeah, I had somebody uh, I had shared some material with that I had provided to him, and then somebody eventually got me a copy of what he wrote. And it was mostly my stuff with his name on it. And I was yeah. I was appalled. Now, I didn't lose any money on it and certainly didn't lose any sleep over it. But, you know, the well, idea of it was just kind of outrageous. There, we have in all aspects of life a concept of ethics over and above what the law requires. Right. Stealing somebody's ideas, stealing somebody's words, it's still theft. That's right. And maybe the law isn't going to do anything about it, but boy, Oh boy, it's still just plain wrong. It stinks, doesn't it? It does. Now, if you want to use a small portion of a work that's in copyright, so it's got copyright protection on it, but you just want to use a paragraph or a one little part of it, it may qualify under the law as what's called fair use. Okay. 
if you're not going to be making any money on it and it isn't going to hurt the commercial value of the book itself or the, the item itself, and you're doing it for research purposes, chances are the law is going to let you do that. If it weren't for that, none of us could have written those term papers back right. when we were in school. Of course. So there are some limited abilities to use this stuff. It's when we go in and we grab 100% of a photograph or 100% of a blog post or anything else. And, and that raises one point that's probably the biggest misconception about this and the most important thing for people to understand. There's a real issue with people thinking, if it's online, I can use it. It is exactly the opposite in wow. the law. If it's online, it is almost guaranteed to be copyright protected because copyright is automatic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The minute that I write a blog post, every single day I hit publish in my program and I have the copyright to that blog post without doing anything more. All right, real quick, because we're running out of time. Photographs, is there a difference with photographs that are out there in terms of copyright uh, duration? No, there's no difference <laughs> at all. Okay. And that again, is a good reason to go to that copyright chart, get an idea of how long copyright lasts, and if it's within copyright, two simple words, get permission. Great advice. She's Judy Russell. She's the legal genealogist. We've learned so much today, Judy. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And coming up next, it's Tom Perry. He is our preservation authority with more on how you preserve your photographs, your films, your videos. On the way on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Remember how fun it was to capture those special moments of your children's childhood on video and watch it back, knowing that you'd be able to have that memory forever. Or watching a home movie of your own childhood and seeing many of your loved ones who are now gone. If you haven't yet digitized those family treasures, you're at risk of losing all of them with each passing day. Time and elements slowly destroy videos and film, as well as rare old photos and audio recordings. Rescuing your memories is what TMCPlace.com has been doing for over 40 years. They can transfer all these disks and hard drives so you and your family can enjoy them digitally for generations to come and without damaging the originals. They provide free shipping both ways on most orders. They even offer GPS real-time tracking of your package so you can be confident that nothing can ever be lost in transit. Call toll-free 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your special project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. How's your family history research going? Are you stuck on a difficult line? Don't know how to start? Let the professionals at Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services help. Heritage Consulting has been providing professional research and consultation services since 1978. They can help you find your own personal family history for far less than you would expect by researching, collecting, analyzing, and interpreting the numerous historical documents your ancestors left in their lifetimes. They'll then provide you with a professionally written report in book or electronic form that you and your family can enjoy for literally generations. Knowledge of your ancestors forges stronger ties within your family and helps children better appreciate who they are within the context of your family history. Call Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services right now. The call is free. Dial 1-877-537-2000. That's 1-877-537-2000. You'll speak directly to an expert genealogist. Find out more at Heritage Consulting dot com. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio. It is Fisher here, the radio root sleuth, along with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority, and of course, you can always ask him questions at AskTom at TMCPlace.com. And Tom, we've had a ton of questions lately from many different people from all over the country about data storage. And I thought maybe we'd kind of combine those and really spend a lot of time today on that topic. Oh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I've got so many different people asking about, hey, I saw this on the Internet. I saw this in the newspaper. You know, is this the best way to go? And let's do that. Let's talk about some different storage ideas. And, you know, I've done a lot of research on the Internet. And, 
you know, can drop a couple of names to let people know, hey, this isn't just my opinion. You know, I've done some research on this. All right. Let's get started then with USB storage. Okay. Good. That's a good place to start. If you want more information, you can go to Lifehackers, Digistores, or Cadzo Tech, which is C-A-D-Z-O-W Tech. They have a lot of information on uh, USBs as well. Basically, the problem with USB storage is a lot of the large enterprises typically have a number of redundancies in place to protect their data in case copies become lost or encrypted or you might lose a DVD or a CD or something. Right. A hard drive could crash. So the big places have redundancy to keep that from happening. But the data storage's best practice indicate that any information stored in the cloud should have at least one copy saved onto an on-premise server. Like I've told people over and over and over again, don't just put stuff on a disk. Don't just put it on a hard drive. Don't just put it in the cloud. You need all three. And in a lot of cases, as you've mentioned before, pick two clouds and make sure the two clouds are different, like an Apple cloud and a Dropbox cloud. Right. And, and we talk about the cost of this. It's typically somewhere around 20 a month, and that cost is coming down. Oh, uh, because has. there's so much competition going on for it. How much money is reasonable to spend on storage? And I guess that's a question that's very individual. Oh, yeah. And it comes right back to, you know, what's it worth to transfer your videos or your audio cassettes or your film? What's it worth? And I tell people constantly when they call and come into one of our locations, I say, you know, you go and spend, say, $500 on a widescreen television, give it to your kids for Christmas. The life of that's, you know, three or four years, five years maybe if you're lucky. If you go and spend that same amount of money transferring your home movies and videos, your kids are going to have it, and your grandkids are even going to appreciate it more than your kids, and it'll be something that they have forever. Absolutely. You know, it's a really smart, and you got to be so careful that you keep this stuff in really, really good condition. And, and you know, this is kind of like my, my wife's got a, a back that's been troubling her lately, and so she's had to make a decision about going to the chiropractor. Do you do it after your back falls out again, or do you do it ahead of time as a preventive measure to keep it from happening in the first place? And so, you know, ultimately, you're going to wind up paying the cost of losing your data. Exactly. Uh, either in, ahead of it or after it. And so this is really good advice, Tom. Oh, it is. In fact, I remember there used to be, back when we were young and television was kind of new, there used to be a transmission place that said, pay me now or pay me later. That's right. <laughs> and that's what it is. And the thing is, the older it gets, the more challenging it is to restore it because it gets worse and worse and worse. We had somebody bring in some photos the other day after they heard last week's segment and says, hey, I've had this hanging in my living room. And unfortunately, there's direct light that's been hitting it. And it has all these little frames. They take off the frames. And at the corners, you can see the picture looks perfect. And the other part is so faded. And so we can go in and we can restore that. However, if they would have done this 10 years ago or put some UV glass on top of it as a preventative maintenance, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I do that for a lot of pictures and my collectibles, too. Oh, absolutely. You have to really be careful with stuff like that. Light is good, but UV is not. Back to the USB that we were talking about. According to InfoWorld, right now, the price of USB drives is basically about $0.66 cents per gigabyte, so it's about you know $85 for one that size. Now, my rule of thumb when I buy them, I usually see them in most stores are about a dollar per gigabyte. And so if it's that or less, that's okay. But be careful that there's different qualities, too, and go on the Internet, research, and find out which are the best ones to get. And as I tell everybody, and please listen to this, USB is not a permanent storage solution. USB is a convenience, like having a pill box on your keychain. Put something on there that you need to go to a friend or you're going to a convention and want to download some stuff. But then when you get home, put it on your hard drive. Dump it to your hard drive ASAP. All right. More on storage, the right way to do it. Coming up with Tom Perry when we return on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. What's in your family's old trunk? Antique photos? Cassette recordings? Wire recordings? Old records? Home movies? Videos from the 80s and 90s? To hear them and see them again? Often restored to unbelievably realistic colors, you need to take them all to the Multimedia Center. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717. Or go to Transfer Duplication. And 
And we are back at Extreme Genes Family History Radio. ExtremeGenes.com is Fish here with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority. And, uh, Tom, we've been talking about storage here. We talked about USB storage, which you say is a convenience. And I can't argue with you on that point. It's nice, though, to have that convenience in case something horrible happens. But, boy, to to count on it would be uh, a big mistake in the long run. So what else do you have for us? Okay, well, you know, on the USB drives, and just to kind of remind people to listen to the first segment or those that are just joining us now, you want to remember anything that you think is really important, you want to store it in multiple places. You want it on a disc, whether you choose Blu-ray, DVD, or CD. Now, wait a minute. A lot of people argue that these CDs, they're going to go away. Well, they're wrong because next week we're going to talk about some of the new things that are coming out on Blu-ray. So the disc is not dead. The disc is not even close to being dead. Not the even disc, on life support, huh? Nope, not even close. And we won't even get into the quartz, 365 terabytes. But basically what you want to remember is store it on a disc, a disc that you have easy access to. Make sure you have it on a hard drive, whether you choose a standard hard drive or the best or the solid state hard drive, less movable parts, you last longer. And we might talk about that some more next week also. And then have it in at least one cloud if you can afford it. Have it in two clouds, like the Apple Cloud and the um, Dropbox Cloud. That way you'll be covered. thing with USB, one of the biggest problems with them, there's a reason that they're so cheap. Unfortunately, if you look at electronics, they are really made out of pretty shoddy materials, the USB drives are, so they can fall. And so we tell people to avoid this. You don't want to use USBs as either a primary or a secondary source. Just use it as a portable convenience type thing. If you're using shoddy products, something's going to happen. They're used a lot, putting in and out of machines, sitting in your pocket. They wear and tear on it, and it's already kind of a not a very good quality device, so that makes it even worse. One of the biggest problems that I see with USB people is that they're impatient, too. Just like we are sometimes, they don't take the time to click on the disengage or put away or whatever button. They just grab the USB drive and pull it out. Rip it out, yes. Oh, and that is so dangerous because if it happens to be writing at that instant to a file, when you pull it out, not only will it corrupt that file, there's a really good chance it's going to corrupt your entire USB drive. Ooh. So I always tell people, use a USB as just a portable device. So, for instance, if you're going to like a family history conference or convention and they give you a little USB drive with all kinds of information on it, great. Take that home, put it on your hard drive, burn a CD of it, put it in the cloud. And another thing tied to that is, okay, say, oh, I've got a solid-state hard drive. Oh, I've got another hard drive. I've got my USB. I've got my cloud. I've got all these things. Now, if you don't put them in a fireproof safe and your house burns down, oh boy, what good did it do to have redundant <laughs> backup? You and know, that's and- another reason to make sure that they are sent all over the place. Send copies of your most important things to your relatives uh, on the other coast. If you're on the East Coast, send it to the West Coast. If you're on the West Coast, send it to the East Coast. Right. Look at the earthquakes we've just seen in oh. Los Angeles here the last oh, yeah. little and while. Washington, those big mudslides. Look yes. at all the stuff that was lost. And like we've talked on the show before, if you live in earthquake country, send it to tornado country. If you live in tornado country, send it to hurricane country. Send it all over. Even send it overseas because you never know when you're going to have a disaster. And if everything's in your fireproof safe, that's really, really good unless your fireproof safe's under a ton of mud. All right. So some great advice here, Tom. Thanks again. And we'll continue this next week because we've just really scratched the surface on this. And, of course, if you have any questions for Tom, you can always email him at asktom at tmcplace.com. So that wraps it up for this week. Thanks once again to the legal genealogist, Judy Russell, for joining us today with some great advice about knowing the law when you're doing genealogy. If you missed it, of course, catch the podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio. And next time, if you think you'll never break through that brick wall, you'll want to be listening. We'll be talking to a man whose father began a search in the early 1950s for his birth father. Decades later, his son searched the world for answers. And finally, over 60 years later, the case has been broken. It's a great listener story. Don't forget, you can catch up with our podcast on iHeartRadio and iTunes. We'll see you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.